In the last episode, the peace of the Edo period was shattered as a violent insurrection arose within the Shimabara Peninsula in Kyushu. It had been caused by a number of unfortunate mounting factors. One reason was the heavy suppression of Christianity, which had come to greatly affect the Christians of Kyushu. The other and far more grave reason was the heavy toll placed upon the peasants by their abhorrently cruel overlord, the daimyo of Shimabara Domain, Matsukura Katsuye. The torment he inflicted on those beneath him could not be endured forever, leading to a massive revolt in which commoners and even ronin joined together into a powerful alliance, and one largely made up of Christians who were united in overthrowing Matsukura rule. Now, in utter shock at the developments in the west, the shogunate has dispatched armies to destroy the rebellion and eliminate it as a threat to the established order and peace of the Edo period. In January of 1638, the largest armed conflict in Japan since 1615 was set to begin. Roughly 25,000 rebels rising up against the cruelty of their ruthless samurai overlord and united by a common Christian faith had burned the castle town surrounding Shimabara Castle and withdrew to the highly defensible Hara Castle where further stockpiles of supplies and arms had bolstered them. The Bakufu under Shogun Tokugawa Iemitsu must have been taken aback by such a development, as his previous efforts had been ones aimed at clamping down at any prospect of insurrection. But besides this, the mere fact that the rebels were largely united by their Christian faith was also a dire concern. The shogunate seems to have fully come to view this threat as primarily a Christian revolt, and yet another reason why Western influence and religion needed to be driven out of the country for good. The rebels were coming to be led by a figure known as Masuda Shiro. The young Shiro had not been involved in the initial stages of the revolt, but after joining the cause, quickly had become one of its major leading figures, claiming that he himself was the second coming of Christ. The shogunate knew they had to end this threat quickly, lest more suppressed Christians rise up across Kyushu. Matsukura Katsuye, the tyrannical daimyo of Shimabara, had been ordered to return back to his home domain to quell the rebellion. Yet on top of this, the shogunate had also dispatched additional forces led by the notable Itakura Shigemasa to act not only as a vanguard force, but also the main military effort to dislodge the rebels. By January, the Bakufu army had reached Hara. The rebels took note of the amassing forces and prepared for what was likely a coming assault. It is estimated that within the stockpiles of weapons that they acquired within Hara, they had come into the possession of some 1,400 firearms. The opposing shogunate forces may not have been aware of this, as by the end of the month, with Itakura, Ishigaya, and Nabeshima forces converging as one, Shigemasa ordered the first attack on the castle. Due to the castle's strategic location along a cliffside, it was only to the north where a conventional assault could really come from. Early in the morning of January 30th, shogunate forces began attempts to storm the castle walls, yet they were met with a hail of bullets as the rebels rained death down upon them. For the first time in over two decades, samurai died by the hundreds, if not thousands. Seeing the attack was failing, Shigemasa called for his forces to fall back from the walls. This then led to a period in which both the shogunate and rebels just resorted to exchanging gunfire for a time. Perhaps driven by the prospect of forcing the rebels to expend their stockpiles of gunpowder and ammunition. Eventually, into February, the shogunate armies received further reinforcements as the Tachibana and Arima moved into join the siege. Of course, as we know from the previous episode, the Arima had been the previous owners of Shimabara Domain and Hara Castle. In fact, many of the ronin who had joined up with the rebel cause had been formerly of the Arima clan. Thus, seeing their old masters on the other side of the field must have been a bitter experience. 
With the shogunate forces refreshed, they would soon launch a second full assault on the castle. Yet, just as in the first attempt, the gunfire from defenders cut the assault to shreds. Despite having superior numbers and fresh troops, they died in mass as they tried relentlessly to seize the walls. Try as they might, they once again were met with failure. Shigemasa was forced to call off his second assault. One record indicates that the shogunate may have suffered as many as 4,500 troops either killed or injured that day. Shigemasa's two failures to take Hara were now plain and clear for all to see, and the Bakufu had certainly taken note of it. Because of this, they would dispatch Matsudaira Nobutsuna, a roju or senior Bakufu elder, to take things over from Shigemasa. Upon learning that he was being replaced for his failures, Itakura Shigemasa became embarrassed and enraged. Thus, on February 14th, before Matsudaira Nobutsuna had arrived to relieve him, Shigemasa would launch one final desperate assault on Hara in attempts to save face. It was a brutal and bloody affair like both previous attempts. The Bakufu forces were once again riddled with gunfire as they charged the walls. Being shot to pieces, their numbers began to dwindle. Soon, the Arima contingent broke and retreated after suffering heavy losses. Seeing no other choice, Shigemasa himself, at 50 years old, rushed forth leading his men in a final heroic attempt to break through. Yet he too would finally be struck by a bullet and was killed on the spot. With his death, his remaining forces withdrew. Records say that his final assault may have had somewhere around 3,000 casualties, both wounded and killed. Thus, after three assaults and in just 20 days' time, the number of shogunate casualties was already reaching up to perhaps 10,000. So far, with no progress in dislodging the rebels. Roughly three days later after Shigemasa's third and final assault, the new shogunate field commander, Matsudaira Nobutsuna, would arrive on the scene. With the size of the shogunate armies now climbing up to perhaps as high as 150,000, the situation was hopeless for the defenders, despite their so far success at keeping the Bakufu forces at bay. In fact, it's quite clear that there never was really any chance for the rebels to have survived. And it might be safe to argue that they knew this too. They chose to seal themselves within Hara, knowing full well that a response from the shogunate would be coming to quell the insurrection. They certainly must have understood what their ultimate fate would be. Yet, they likely chose this path under the intention to all be martyred themselves, to die fighting for what they believed, and to go on into eternal glory in the arms of God. Perhaps the farthest dream of survival they would ever have had was that other Christian foreigners would arrive to save them from their distress, or at the very least, that their valiant efforts would stir more Christians across the country into revolt. But these were all just distant hopes. In reality, they likely understood their fate and chose to face it as stoically as they could. Their stores of supplies within Hara would not last forever, and if the shogunate just chose to siege down the castle as they were beginning to do now under Nobutsuna, then Hara would surely fall in time. This begs the question, however, why did Itakura Shigemasa even attempt to storm the castle in the first place? Well, there are a couple of reasons we could speculate over. First off is the relatively easy to understand concept that putting down this revolt as quickly as possible was the most ideal thing to do. As for as long as this situation dragged out, tension would continue to seep out of Shimabara and could stir others suppressed into rising up as well. Not to mention the rather unrealistic fear that perhaps the rebel effort would even be recognized by other Catholics such as the Spanish or Portuguese who may try to intervene in their favor. Ending things quickly was just all around for the best. Yet, another serious reason was likely the quest for glory that Shigemasa was likely after. We have to remember that this is a man who had lived through the end of the Sengoku Jidai. He had seen the final years of the warring era and the renown that came to the brave heroes who fought. Yet, now living in an age of peace, there was little opportunity to make a name for oneself in battle. Battle being the sole purpose of the warrior, an identity the samurai were slowly losing touch with. Shigemasa may have sought to seize Hara by force, not only to heap fame upon his own name, but to realize the glory of past days, the warfare of old that was no longer seen. This opens the door to another interesting concept, 
that the samurai as warriors were becoming perhaps less effective as the peace of the Edo period weakened their martial prowess. Three times Shigemasa's forces had failed to seize Hara and perhaps exposed how weak the samurai had become. Obviously we know this not to be true. The real cause of defeat during the initial three assaults were due to incredibly hard to storm walls backed by waves of gunfire which tore through every attack. But perhaps at the time, this was seen as an indicator of the samurai losing their warrior identity. If under samurai leadership, the shogunate armies could not overcome a rabble of peasants and ronin. This must have also made the situation look even more dire for the shogunate itself, as they certainly did not want anyone thinking the samurai had lost their edge. Iemitsu had been working hard to project an image of strength and military power. How would things look if his armies could not win here against foes such as these? Matsudaira Nobutsuna, after the failures of Shigemasa, was under strict orders from Shogun Iemitsu to not let any more Bakufu soldiers die recklessly. The situation had already become embarrassing enough as it was. This was a path that Nobutsuna was willing to accept, and he was lucky to not have any hot-headed commanders beneath him who may have sought action. These were all likely younger men who had known more of peace than of war in the new age. However, stories do tell of another famed samurai who was supposedly present here for the siege, that of the legendary Musashi Miyamoto, who is said to have acted in an advisory role to the shogunate. It's not entirely known to what the full extent of his exploits might have been at the siege, but it is an interesting detail to ponder over. Nobutsuna was content to simply starve out the rebels, but if possible, he wanted to try everything in his power to speed up his eventual victory. One of the first plans he attempted was that of securing an offshore bombardment of the castle. If we remember back to the siege of Osaka, Tokugawa Ieyasu had broken the will of the defenders of Osaka during the winter siege by using artillery to shell the castle into submission. A similar trick was going to be attempted here at Hara. Surprisingly enough, the way this worked was that the Japanese were able to negotiate with their Dutch trading partners to use one of their vessels to sail out around Hara and bombard it from the sea. The Dutch may have found this a bit difficult, being that they were firing on fellow Christians, despite the fact that they were firing on Catholics and not Protestants. Either way, they agreed to help the Japanese, and by late February, a Dutch ship known as De Ripe arrived off the coast of Shimabara. The defenders might have initially rejoiced at seeing the ship, perhaps believing that it was the Portuguese or other fellow Christians coming to save them. Yet they would have realized the unfortunate truth when the ship began firing its five-pound guns at the castle. Cannonballs smashed into the stone walls of Hara, while others ricocheted off the sides. Some even flew over the top of the castle completely and endangered the lives of the shogunate forces beyond. When the ship got close enough in range, the rebels would attempt to return fire with their matchlocks, and it is even recorded that this may have led to the deaths of several Dutch sailors. For two weeks, this bombardment continued, yet the five-pound guns of the ship were simply not enough to deal significant damage to Hara. Thus, they were eventually ordered to withdraw. All in all, the ship is believed to have fired a total of 426 shots. With the failure of using the ship to speed up surrender, Nobutsuna then moved on to attempt to use another form of psychological warfare. The shogunate forces began using arrows to fire messages into Hara, claiming that if they surrendered, that all the non-Christians would be spared. And not only that, but their taxes would be reduced as well. The rebels still refused, citing their unity. Next, Nobutsuna then tried to prey on the heart of the rebel leader, Masuda Shiro, by bringing his mother and sister before the castle as hostages, who would suffer if he did not surrender. Yet still, he did not back down. The resolve of the rebels continued to prove to be absolute. One of the final major attempts to bring a swifter end to the siege was an attempt made by the Hosokawa to blow a hole in the wall. After digging a long ditch up to the castle and chiseling a small hole within the wall where gunpowder could be packed and then lit, the resulting explosion left much to be desired. Sadly, it went off more like a flash than a bomb and caused little damage. In the end, Nobutsuna accepted that the only thing that could be done by the shogunate was to simply wait things out until the rebels would fully begin to starve. There are several indications of when this finally began and when the Bakufu became aware of it. By the middle of March, the situation for the rebels was becoming dire. 
and the will of some of the defenders was starting to break. Records indicate that a rebel samurai within Hara named Yamada Umenosuke decided to betray his comrades and communicate secretly with the Bakufu armies outside to let them know that supplies within the castle were running low. Still, the Bakufu sat waiting. By early April, the situation had become disastrous for the rebels. Groups of men within Hara would occasionally attempt night raids to strike at one of the encamped armies to steal away with some food. One of these, which was intercepted, had their bodies cut open. The shogunate was able to examine the contents of their stomachs. It was here they came to discover that the rebels were out of rice, and were instead relying on seaweed, tree leaves, and unripened barley. This was the full confirmation of the dire situation that Nobutsuna was looking for. Roughly a week later, the final assault would begin. What is interesting to note is that the attack may not have been actually ordered, and that it may have been a mistake called after a signal fire was lit on accident. Either way, the massive force of the shogunate armies once again threw themselves against the walls of Hara Castle. This time, however, they would finally successfully break through. Despite yet another hail of bullets that the defenders spewed out upon the charging attackers, the sheer volume of them mixed with the weakened ability of the defenders and perhaps the lower supply of available gunpowder allowed the shogunate to breach the walls and smash their way in. Although many of the defenders were sickly and weak, they still put up a stiff resistance as shogunate fought their way through to the citadel. With its fall, the rebellion was over. The final assault on Hara had resulted in thousands of more casualties for the shogunate. And thus, by the end of the siege, of the 150,000 strong force the shogunate had brought to bear against Hara, 20,000 of them, 13%, were either killed or wounded. Following the end of the siege, the majority of the remaining rebel forces were put to the sword, executed for their disastrous revolt. The heads of rebel leaders were displayed atop pikes in Nagasaki, and the local daimyo were all assessed for their own dealings with peasants after the Matsukura had been so careless. And this is what finally brings us to the fate of Matsukura Katsuie, the figure who had caused the entire ordeal. The Bakufu knew that he was responsible for the whole situation, and upon the fall of Hara and the brutal execution of its leaders, the shogunate would imprison Katsuie for his behavior, and would later behead him. Hara Castle would later be demolished as well, and with the memory of both Katsuie and Hara eradicated, they had wiped away the stain of this great failure. Yet still, much work had to be done to ensure a similar situation never arose again. About a month after the end of the siege, Matsudaira Nobutsuna would issue a ten-article edict to the people of Shimabara. Its regulations were as follows. Item 1. Buddhist priests, Shinto priests, townspeople, and farmers alike must return to living peaceably as in previous times. Item 2. Since a large number of peasants joined the rebel army, vast tracts of land have been abandoned. Those peasants from other parts of Japan who wish to take responsibility for farming that land may in turn do so. Item 3. It is forbidden to harbor peasants who have absconded from neighboring villages. Item 4. The balances of outstanding tax debts are discharged. Item 5. The debt of those whose tax was collected in labor and other outstanding labor obligations are absolved. Item 6. Henceforth, Christianity is strictly prohibited. Relationship or communication with Christians as well as secret prayer is likewise forbidden. Item 7. Reckless deforestation is prohibited. Item 8. Foreclosure and riotous behavior in the marketplace is prohibited. Item 9. The buying and selling of persons is prohibited. And item 10. Giving shelter or assistance to masterless samurai, ronin, is absolutely forbidden. 18th of May, 1638. With these edicts, the shogunate not only tried to lessen the burden that had previously been upon the shoulders of the peasants of Shimabara, but also it served to attempt to prevent further insurrection. Some of the most important elements of this document are the removing of debts that had previously been owed to the Matsukura, as well as the removal of buying and selling people into slavery, something which had become common for peasants who could not pay their tax debts. On a wider scale, the rebellion 
which had come to be largely viewed as a Christian one despite its real origins, was firmly snuffed out. And thus, those across Japan and abroad heard the news of the great Christian revolt which was brutally put down by the samurai. This perhaps being one of the best possible side effects that Shogun Iemitsu could have hoped for, as it was common knowledge now how any Christian rebellion would end up, and would hopefully dissuade any future attempts made by European nations to spread Christianity in Japan. So as we can see, although the rebellion had been a savage and embarrassing affair, at least during its actual time, in the aftermath, it served further as a triumphant mark for the shogunate, instilling a greater sense of shogunal authority across the land, as the Bakufu worked to clamp down even harder. What Iemitsu likely realized was that the real problem was Matsukura Katsuie. He had been the cause of the rebellion due to his tyrannical leadership. It was the type of behavior that Iemitsu wanted daimyo to avoid. Daimyo were of course supposed to run their domains efficiently with a level head, being stern when necessary and relaxed when situations permitted. Peasants for the most part were to be respected due to the fact of just how integral they were to the overall system. Katsuie had never realized this fact, and because of the brutal oppression he displayed, he had caused a major uprising. But now he was gone, and the only thing that remained was the shogunate's victory at Shimabara, and the fruits of this achievement which could be utilized for future endeavors. Perhaps the time was right to thoroughly close the country for the sake of preserving peace, security, stability, and Japan's natural order. In the next episode, we will see the ultimate closure of the country, as the age of Sakoku will begin. If you want to learn more about revolts in pre-modern Japan, check out the links below from the monthly Japanese history collaborative series that I've been a part of. This month's topic is actually revolts, so I thought this video would fit in it very well. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.